You know, as uh, we <clears throat> come to God's word, it's always, you know, it's always good to kind of think about scripture like the one another's of scripture, you know, where you, you think about people and the body and you try to make sure that you, you honor them and you help them. And last night about 8 p.m., I was just thinking of uh, people who typically wear the color green. I'm going to have to rejoice with them, you know, because the scriptures say rejoice with those who rejoice, right? So I was fully prepared to do that. Uh, but then... You know, the game went on, and the people who were blue and gold, uh, you know, they, they, they prevailed. And I just thought about the people in green, and I just thought, I need to mourn with those who mourn. I mean, I just, uh, during the passing of the peace, uh, a godly woman just said, don't gloat. Um, and uh, so this is me not gloating, okay? Let's pray. God, we give you thanks for uh, bringing us together as your family. Thank you for your word. And thank you that we can gather together and share your word and understand it. So we pray as we come this morning, you would open our hearts and our minds to what you have to say to us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we are uh, in the uh, fourth week of Make a Plan. And this is a sermon series in which we're, we're learning that we have a part in our discipleship. We've learned that God is our disciple maker and that he's always working through the events of our life. And, you know, it's just interesting. I was talking with people before the service and just the events of people's lives shape us, whether it's something that we're suffering in our physical body or it's just a life change. And and we all know that God is always working through that. And we've also learned that we need to be able to understand sort of the baselines of spiritual dynamics, like reading scripture and praying and things like that. We've also learned that we need to go along a particular pathway and understand how we've been made, that we've been fearfully and wonderfully made, and that we need to to move into that. And so one of the things that we're doing is leaning into this portion of our discipleship plan, which is how we can grow. Now, if you're interested in exploring the expanded teachings from our Make a Plan series, there are two easy ways to access past messages, because if you've been around, you'll know that I've sort of compiled a number of things that we've been teaching together, been building slowly but surely an understanding of our part in discipleship. So there are two easy ways to access past messages. You can go to the Church Center app, and you simply open the app, sign in, and you'll find all the messages listed right on the home page, and just click to watch. Or you can do this, you can go to our website, and if you don't have the Church Center app, you just go to forestparkcov.org, and near the top of the page, you look for a a a make-a-plan resource image. It looks like that. And then when you click on that image, it will direct you to Church Center, where you will also find a message list, which will look like this, and you can just click on one of those messages. If you'd like to know a little bit more about uh, the baselines, if you'd like to know a little bit more about particular pathways, you can just click onto that. As we go forward, there are some messages about spiritual gifts and so on. Today, we're going to talk uh, about the practices of discipleship. That is, what is it that we're supposed to particularly do? And you know, one of the key passages that we've looked at is Matthew 28. And this is when Jesus is departing from the earth. He's going to leave his Holy Spirit to guide and direct us. And the scripture says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. I was always struck by this phrase, everything I have commanded you. And so I began to wonder what that was. And you see in your participant guide on page 14, a condensed list of the commands of Jesus. Though they don't comprise every command, they do comprise, in summary, about 80 to 90 percent of what Jesus commanded. And I will show this uh, work and make a plan links next week, but if you want to do it yourself, just if you want to make an overview of how Jesus commanded everything, all you have to do is read all four Gospels, and underline his commands, and then you compile. It's very easy to do on BibleGateway.com. But I did it because I'm, I'm a worldview pathway person. I like to do that work. And if you're more of a relational pathway, you'll probably be just satisfied leaning on this work. And so on page 14, you see this list. 
Now, uh, I'm going to just say for this list, it's a little bit hard to read. I'm just going to leave it up there, but you can see it a little bit more clearly on page 14. Now, I could go over all of these commands, but instead, I, I want to read a passage in the life of Jesus that gets after the nature of commands in general. It gets after this, this question. Why did Jesus command that? Why did, why did Jesus want us to do that? And oftentimes when you ask that question, what you receive back from people is because he wants us to obey. Yes, but why does he want us to obey? What is there behind commands and obedience that we need to understand? In Matthew 22, you might want to just open to that if you have a Bible, Matthew 22. Uh, Jesus has asked a question about scripture interpretation. And it was a command that if a woman was married to a man, the, the Torah, the, the ancient scriptures said that if a, man was married, if a woman was married to a man and that man died, then the next of kin, usually an unmarried brother, would then have to marry her. It was a kind of social service net. But certain religious leaders in that day of Jesus, known as Sadducees, only believed in the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, oftentimes called the Torah. And in that, because that was the only thing that they depended on, they had certain beliefs that other people didn't have. For instance, they didn't believe in an afterlife. And they didn't believe in angelic spirits. And so this question is finely tuned to try to catch Jesus in some form of bad teaching. Some way in which they could go, aha. So here's how it says, Matthew 22, 24. Teacher, they said, Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for him. Now, there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died, and since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and third brother right on down to the seventh. Finally, the woman died. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven since all of them were married to her? Now, if you've ever been asked a question like this, you know that the question is, being, is designed in order to snag you because an afterlife in which there's this sort of chaos seems kind of strange. It's sort of an, a subversive way of arguing that there is no afterlife. You get that? Like if you've ever been asked trip up questions, this is kind of what's happening right here. But Jesus didn't answer their legal question with a legal answer, but said this instead, Matthew 22, 29 through 32. Jesus says, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. Just as an aside, when people ask me trip up questions, this is what I think is happening. To use the scriptures to try to catch people and by catching them to diminish what they believe. And this is what Jesus says. You, you don't know the scriptures. They're not, they're not intended for this. At the resurrection, he says, though this is going to bother some of you who love your spouse, and rightfully so, like every time I read this, uh, I just kind of want to just give that little heads up. But at the same time, the person who's saying it is Jesus. So it's not my fault. All right. So at the resurrection, Jesus says, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like angels in heaven. It's not to say you won't know the person. Just the way you experience marriage now isn't the way it will be in heaven, because he knows. But about the resurrection of the dead, Jesus says, have you not read that God said to you, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. And of course, this impressed the crowds, because it actually called out the Sadducees, what? Their unbelief. Their unbelief in the God who wrote the scriptures by showing them that they don't, they don't really understand it at all, that, that the scriptures aren't there 
to be used as a sort of trap for other people. So here's what happens, though. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, there was another branch of people, a Pharisee, who was very impressed. They believed in every piece of Scripture, so much so that they knew the Scriptures backward and forward and were, as we would say, legalistic. They knew all the laws. They had actually numbered them. 613 or 614. And not only did they know them, they kept them all. I mean, I don't, I can't memorize 613 things at all. I mean, but they did. And so the question that they ask is, is a little bit different. Verse 34, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together and one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Again, it's not a belief question, it's a testing question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus answered this question quite directly and says this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments, which means to say that everything that is written can be referred back to these commandments, which also implies that everything that Jesus commands can be referred back to these two commandments. So instead of getting caught in the weeds, Jesus directs us to these two commandments, love God, love others. But what's astounding is not only did Jesus condense the commands and simplify them, he got right to the heart of commandments and obedience. What is at the heart of them all? To love. To love. So whenever you read a command of Jesus, or you should do this, or you should do that, it all comes down to whether or not you're loving God or loving others. Now, if the commandments of Jesus are so important and they can be given in this phrase, the question still remains, why make commandments at all? I mean, like if you can just condense them down to this, and the answer must be that each one looks at different parts of our life and directs them to love. And so we have a representative set of commands all throughout scripture you know if you were to read all of the scriptures from beginning to end you would not be able to cover every aspect of your life in our day and age what does it mean for a plumber to love God and love others does it mean for a, a neurosurgeon what does it what does it mean for a person who drives an uber what does it mean <clears throat> for a politician in a democratic society to love God and to love others. And so what's being said here is that everything is under Jesus' lordship and everything moves back to love. Because here's this, this is the phrase that I would just rephrase this. Commands are given to obey because the reward, the reward of obedience is the life of love. So as you obey you become loving. Now, years ago, uh, we were teaching our children to read, and we, we would go to a library every week, and we'd take back like 40 books. I'd take 10, Marsha would take 10, Jonathan would take 10, Jesse would take 10, and the librarians were astounded. I mean, and you know, we were trying to teach them a lesson that we love books, right? So uh, we got to the summer, and they had a reading program, and the reading program itself was if you read X number of books, I think somebody's got something going on there. All right? Um, if you read a certain number of books, then you'll get prizes, like a pencil or an eraser or some candy. If you really read a lot of books, you get some candy. And they're like, Ken, would you like to sign up your children for this? And I was like, no. And they were just like, well, how, what, what, what's wrong with you? I'm like, the reward of reading is reading. 
If I teach them that the reward of reading is a Tootsie Pop, they're going to expect a Tootsie Pop every time they read a book, and that's just not going to happen, right? So when we start thinking about commandments, the reward of commandments and obeying is about who we're becoming as we're obeying. It's about becoming a person that can be characterized as somebody who loves God and loves others. We are to do things in order to receive the true reward. So Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's like if you hold on to money, that's your treasure, that's where your heart is. But if through money you're holding on to God, then you treasure God, then that's where your heart is. So we want to just think about these lists. These lists here, as I just put them up, they're meant to help us. If, it's, if Jesus is true to his word, to love God and love others, then we need to be true to our word. And the, this list focuses on the true life of a disciple, which leads us to the life of love. You know, a recent theologian uh, was talking to a group of pastors who had been preaching from the Sermon on the Mount, which is a, is a key text for me and for most pastors. And it has a lot of phrases in it which are hard and difficult. And some of them sound as if he's embracing, that is, Jesus is embracing weakness. You know, turn the other cheek, pray for those who persecute you. And so as these pastors were preaching these, these texts, they were getting pushback from people who were saying something like this. That, that's from a different time in a different age. That's just weak, what Jesus is talking about. You can't, I don't care what you're preaching on. And the theologian was astounded by it. I hope you are too. People were saying that the teaching of Jesus was weak, but actually the teaching of Jesus as it points toward love is of ultimate strength. Strength in whom we become and strength in God, right? And so as we just think about this, let me just kind of go through uh, this and how this works for each one of these particular 10 practices. So number one, if you spread the good news, you will see others delivered from a life without the love of God to a life teeming with God's love. That's why it's, it's a little bit perilous when you seek to spread the good news and you see people as projects. That's actually not loving, right? And yet at the same time, it's a command to spread the good news. So in spreading the good news at talking about Jesus, we need to find the love behind what it is there. And so to spread the good news simply is about us loving others and wanting them to love God. Two, if you seek inner transformation, becoming a true child of God, you will be more able to love others. You will turn the other cheek and love others. You will be transformed into the family likeness, a family filled with love and grace. And so Matthew 6, 6, go into the inner room and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And the reward is to be with God and to be a person of love. So the entire Sermon on the Mount and all of Jesus' teaching are moving us toward this inner transformation where we actually become loving people. It's funny when you're, you're around the people in church ministry and we know each other, you know, we, sometimes we kind of give ourselves a kind of, you know, nudging elbow and we just say ministry would be great except for the people, you know. And you know, in that nudge, there's, there's just a little grain of truth because it's hard to love people. And if you want to just personalize it, it's hard to love you, right? It's hard to love me. And yet what the scriptures are promising, and I just find this to be amazing, no matter who you are, no matter what background you've found yourself in, whether you've been in a broken family, you've never understood the love of a father or a mother, you've never experienced that, as you live your life in the, among the people of God, 
you begin to learn to love others. And it deepens and transforms you. Three, if, if you live by faith, not fear, seeing that God is for you, that God loves you, you will overcome fear. Just reminded of the phrase in 1 John, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. So Matthew 17, 20 says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move. You know, the, the faith of a mustard seed is very tiny. It doesn't focus in on the size of the task, but on the minusculeness of faith. Like a mustard seed, if you've ever held one, it, you know, I've preached this sermon before, and oftentimes I'll get like a couple mailings with people who will send me a mustard seed. It's very tiny, and it grows into a great big bush. It's really this understanding that it just takes a little bit of faith when we have that little bit of faith, we access the almighty power of God who loves us. You see? When you don't put love in that, you have faith that accesses the almighty power of God, all of a sudden, God becomes what? The force. The force. Which is, a, you know, for those of you who don't know, a Star Wars reference. An impersonal unconnected energy field. And that's not what God is. And so as we, we live into faith, we begin to dispense with fear and we begin to love others. For if, if you seek healing for yourself and others, you go right to the heart of God who wants people healed and whole. And the healing of ourselves allows us to love ourselves and to love others. You know, I, I don't know if this happens to you, but every once in a while I'll be sleeping and I'll wake up and I'll have injured myself. <laughs> this past week I woke up and there was just this little pain on the inside of my knee. And I was like, how did that happen? Please don't tell me that's because I'm just getting older, you know? But sometimes we, we have these little owies in our body. And the only thing I could really think about was that pain. So whether you have a, maybe you have a hangnail right now or, you know, you have a slight headache. You know, when you're in pain, you just, that's what you feel. God is really invested in our healing because he's seeking to lift our pain away from us. Whether it's the pain of your past or the pain of something that's going on physically. I take very seriously when somebody is physically ill and I just want to pray for them. I've prayed for many, many people. And God does miracles. And oftentimes we have no idea that that miracle has been done. But God wants people healed because God wants them to know that he loves them when you're healed and also that we become channels of love. It's just so amazing when you look through the Gospels, this phrase in Matthew 14, 14, Jesus felt compassion for them and healed their sick. And then he told others, his disciples, you go out, you preach, you teach, and you heal. And I just think that because of those commands in the Gospels, which are kind of indirect commands, they're commands to us to be engaged in that. Because God loves us. Here's the next one. Seeking first the kingdom of God means you will see that the world is meant to be governed by the law of God, that what is done in heaven, fully experiencing the love of God will be done here on earth. Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things will be added to you. And so the reference of seeking God's kingdom, you're seeking that injustices would be made just. And people who are unloved would be loved. And people who are unhealed would be healed. And that the world would be governed by God's love and graciousness and mercy. How God's people transform from the inside out, how we long for that. Because we know and understand that God is a God of love. The next one, following Jesus as your leader will lead you down paths of healing grace and kingdom love. Jesus says, follow me and I will make you fishers of people. 
It's interesting that this command uh, connects to the first command, you know, to spread the good news. He is calling us to follow him. And when we, we follow him, he doesn't actually just give us um, like a barcode. You know how you put a barcode on somebody or you get a wristband and then that gives you free access to things and then you walk around in whatever you've been access to doing whatever you want to do. Jesus isn't leading us that way. When we go somewhere with Jesus, he leads us into that place and he's actually with us there. And behold, I'm with you to the end of the age. Jesus leads us. And when we are led by him, we see the world the way he sees the world. He sees the world with compassion and love. He sees people in need. And he wants us as his people to to meet that need. And as we obey the command to follow Jesus, we become kingdom people who see the world that way. If you are compassionate, the next one, especially to the poor, you will see the value that God has on all whom he loves. Matthew 9, 36 and 38. He felt, Jesus felt compassion for them. And he said, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out workers. You know, I'm very, very strongly for global missions. And I love our missions team. And we support global missions uh, throughout our budget and so on. And I, I started this journey way back in 1979 through the Urbana Missionary Conference. I was talking to a, a, a person here about being, you know, born in 1960 and then graduating uh, from high school in 78. And they, they hadn't been born uh, until the you know, what was it, 2008. So it's been a long time. And it's interesting that this passage, uh, pray the Lord of the harvest and workers out in the harvest, gets used almost predominantly and only by mission-centered kinds of ideas, which I think is right. But it's actually more powerfully centered around having compassion for people just in general. Just seeing people and seeing their need and wanting to meet it. And you know, we need inner transformation because when we meet people who are unlovely, we have to know and understand that God loves them and sees them through that eye. And we need to also move into that and seeing people that way. And we want to be the kind of people that seeks a compassion, especially for the poor. Here's the next one. If you forgive, you will be freed from unforgiveness, and this will lead you to a life uh, of love and freedom from bitterness. You know, one of the great uh, teachers on forgiveness was a man named Louis Smeeds. He wrote a book called Forgive and Forget. Forgive and Forget. He grew up here in Muskegon, did you know that? Right here in Muskegon. And that book, of course, it's an older book. It was written in the, you know, the 20th century, so long ago, um, that a lot of people haven't read it. But the understanding of it has really lodged within our Christian culture. Because when you don't forgive, when you're unable to forgive, something really drastic happens inside of you. Something which God doesn't want for you. Since God wants you to be able to forgive, he wants you to be a person who can extend love to anyone. I don't know if you've been seriously wronged by somebody or you view that you have been seriously wronged by somebody. A lot, a lot of people have that view of having been seriously wronged by somebody. I have that view. And when I think about the person who seriously wronged me, I remember that Jesus says, if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. I just remember it. And I just sort of grip my teeth. And at first, I just start praying for them. I just have to, because I think that the scriptures will release me. And then as time goes on, I'm able to pray for them in much more powerful ways. Doesn't mean I'll ever become their friend. You know, it's, I've forgotten that, but I'm not asking you to somehow become buddies with the person that maybe wronged you. However, 
God doesn't want what they did to you to become something that is so destructive to you that you no longer are a person who is ruled by the God of love, you see? And that's one of the reasons why God wants us to forgive. We've been forgiven by Jesus Christ coming to earth, dying on the cross and paying for our sins. Because of that payment, we have life with God, the life of, with the God of love. And because we've been forgiven, we're called to forgive. One of the hardest teachings, one of the hardest commands to actually do in certain circumstances, it's the hardest to do <laughs> when you don't really like the person and you don't really want to forgive them. That's, that's when it's hardest. But you will find that if you are able to do that, a miracle happens in your life. Sometimes people think that miracles don't happen, and I, do. I think the miracle of forgiveness is unbelievable. Here's the next one. If you are alert against evil, you will seek to free others from the kingdom of hate. So Jesus says in Matthew 25, 13, be on alert then because you do not know the day or the hour. The alertness is about the coming of evil. So evil exists in this world. So this idea of loving God and loving others is not nebulous, nor is it wishy-washy or touchy-feely. You understand? It is strong, steadfast. It's a rock because it's built upon the nature of who God is. And so when you are faced with evil, you have to be alert to it. I'm very alert to it. I've seen it inside and outside the church. It is most devastating, I would just have to say, when you see it inside the church. And you, you just think to yourself, how can this be? It can be because Satan is alive and well. And so we have to be alert. We have to obey that command. Not to be sort of like a macho person or to like beat somebody down, but because we are emissaries of the God of love. We love people. Even those embroiled in evil things, we love them. Because why? God loves them. And then here's this final thing. If you steward your resources, you will be freed from the idolatry of wealth, which will lead you to see that God, the one who seeks love everywhere, is the owner of all things. If you don't steward your wealth, that is, if you don't see that everything you have is actually God's, you will have this sort of hand movement, and it'll become tighter and tighter, and it is very difficult to see God at work in your life and in the life of others when you are holding on to this idolatrous golden calf. So let it go. And again, hard commandment. It's not just a commandment for you to sort of legalistically do that. It's a commandment for you to understand that the God of love wants it for you so that you would be a whole person. We practice Jesus' commands in order to obey from the heart. And that's what it means. So what I would just ask you to do as you're doing your worksheets this week is to go through the practices. It may well be that you'll add an 11th and you're just like, I'm going to just love God and love others, which is fine and really fine. But more likely, you'll look at one of these 10s and through that one of those 10, you will realize this is a place where I really need to work. And this is where God's love will access into my soul. All right? All right, let's pray. We give you thanks, our Father, for sending your Son into the world. We thank you, Lord Jesus, not only that you came to save us, but also that you gave us so many direct teachings to help us to be freed up from the things that would enslave us so that we could be your true children, your children who love others and love you. And so we pray today that you might guide and direct us to become more and more like your son. We pray this in his name. Amen.
Let's stand and respond to the word that we've heard.